<laughs> thank, thank you very much, Basil. Uh, I am audible, am I? I, I must say, I'm, I'm a New Zealander by descent, so it's, it's a great pleasure for me to be here. I'm astonished that 150 or so people are here rather than on the beach. <laughs> and let me tell you a, a nice story about New Zealand, um, which um, happened to me a couple of days ago, actually, which some of you already heard. I came over to the business school for breakfast last week, and it was the crack of dawn when I, I'm staying in Devonport with my mother. Crack of dawn when I rushed down to the ferry terminal to get on the boat. And I got on the boat and went down to buy my ticket as we sailed off from the pier. And they said, sorry, sir, this boat is going to Waiheke. And I thought, oh, dear, I'm going to miss my breakfast. But they turned around and took me back. They didn't quite say we get idiots like you all the time, but th this can be the only country in the world where they treat you, us, like that, and it's great to be here. I, am, I have, however, spent most of my career as a British diplomat, and one of my favourite definitions of a diplomat is a man who thinks twice before saying nothing. <laughs> so I'm rather hoping to disabuse you of that impression of at least this British diplomat this evening. Um, and what you're going to get is effectively a very rapid tour through my career and the energy implications of it. And let me just give you the highlights of that tour in summary first. I started my career in, in Egypt, in the Middle East. They taught me Arabic. And I was there over the time that Sadat made peace with Israel and then was killed. But being in that part of the world at that time, you could not but be conscious of how important it is in energy terms and how deeply unstable and unpredictable the politics there are. And those two facts, of course, interact. And I'm going to devote a bit of time to that. I then went back to London and eventually Brussels and worked in the European Commission on environmental issues. And I find myself in engaged in the first round of, of global negotiations about global climate change, which is obviously a, a subject intimately related to our energy policies. And I'm going to devote a little bit of time to that, probably the most frustrating negotiations I have ever taken part in. But it was very good for my bridge. And then thirdly, towards the end of my career, they sent me off to Russia. Um, I don't know if I'd misbehaved at some stage, but they taught me Russian. Russia was changing dramatically. And Russia was in particular at that time turning into what they themselves describe as an energy superpower. Russia is currently the world's largest producer of oil and largest producer of gas. And I'm going to say a few words about that. But before I get on to the particular, uh, the particular chapters of my talk, let me start off with my title, A World in Flux. Why is the energy world today different? And the answer is, there's a graph of crude oil prices uh, over the last, God knows, 100 and something years. And it comes in sort of three phases. Look at the red line, which is real prices, rather than the blue line, which is nominal prices. For a long, long time, they remain pretty stable at about 15 or so dollars a barrel. You then hit the oil shock of the beginning of the 70s, and they go up to about 30 or so dollars a barrel. And we lived with that for another 20 years or so. And then recently, within the last 10 years, we've had a second in effect oil shock, and they've shot up to order of magnitude $90 a barrel. We're in a world today of expensive oil in historic terms, and that is why the world is in flux. We're still adapting to that fact, and our global politics are also adapting to that fact. Now, why? have the prices gone up at a time, actually, when the world economy is in a bit of a mess, when oil demand is down in lots of places? The answer is that while demand in developed countries, like New Zealand, and more uh, bigger in economic terms, the United States and the UK, is pretty flat, the non-OECD, notably China, India, Brazil, is taking off. That's where all the extra demand is coming from. So when you read newspaper stories saying the US is in recession, oil prices are going to go down, don't believe it. The real driver of prices today, if you have to identify one place, is China. And that's a very crucial shift in the balance of forces in global energy markets. And it's a shift that, unless China implodes, which is not impossible but is unlikely, is going to go on for the foreseeable future. And the other thing that you tend to read in the newspapers is, in any case, oil, gas, they're yesterday's story, coal, they're yesterday's story. It's renewables that are coming along. It's wind, it's all of that. This also you should treat with a certain amount of caution. That is the current breakdown of global energy consumption. And if you look at the three big, big chunks of the circle, it's all oil, coal, and natural gas. The rest, 
up there in the corner is all the rest, including nuclear, hydro, all the rest. And if you read things like the BP have recently produced a 30-year energy forecast, that's roughly how it's going to stay over the next quarter of a century. There'll be a slight expansion in renewables, but frankly, we are stuck with all of these tedious and troubling old energy sources for certainly the rest of my life and for quite a lot of your lives out there. So that's the energy picture. There is one big uncertainty which I must mention now, both about the price prospects and about the shape of demand, and that is something which has happened really very dramatically in the United States in the last decade or so, which has been the emergence of um, uh, what's called shale gas and also shale oil. This is uh, gas and eventually oil uh, produced by unconventional techniques. Oil men who don't like big words call it fracking. It's hydraulic fracturing. Um, and the effect is that the United States, which was a, a region of steadily declining oil and gas production, suddenly is, has a vast new source of, of gas and eventually of oil. And this is a development which is pregnant with quite serious uh, political potential consequences. Shale gas has moved in the, in the US from 1% of production in the year 2000 to about 20% now, projected to be 46%, nearly half by 2035. They're already gas self-sufficient. So lots of countries in the Gulf and elsewhere that planned to export their gas to the United States now aren't, and they're looking for other markets for their gas. And indeed, in the United States itself, coal producers are exporting their coal to Europe and elsewhere because it can no longer compete with gas prices. This is a very serious potential change. You will read about it in hyperbolic um, terms in the energy and the business press. Half believe it. Certainly there's been a huge change in the United States. Certainly that may carry big further changes elsewhere. These are estimated uh, shale gas deposits around the world. Very big in China, therefore potentially very important. Quite big in Europe. But when you read any of this stuff, you have to aim off a little bit for the hype. Um, nobody really knows how much of this stuff is genuinely extractable. Nobody really knows, outside the United States, how much of it is going to be blocked by environmental and other concerns. Nobody really knows how good the estimates are. The story from Poland is actually rather a compelling one. When first the Poles identified their shale gas deposits, which this was a great way of getting out from under the Russians, from whom they buy all their gas at the moment, um, they were estimated about 110 trillion cubic feet, which is vast. Um, then, a year later, someone did a re-estimate and cut that number by 90%. <laughs> the numbers are still all over the place, so I'd be a little bit cautious about seeing a total revolution yet. But there's certainly the potential for a revolution out there, and that will be one of the shadows hanging over the reliability of everything I say to you from now on. OK, I'm going to start now my, my tour around the world. I'm going to start with Russia. Um, I know Russia is a long, long way from New Zealand, uh, but I'm slightly obsessed with the place. And Russia exemplifies in all sorts of splendid ways issues in the global energy politics, which are then reproduced very much in other places. Now, I want to go back to my price graph. And the reason I want to go back is to underline how important energy is in Russia. What this graph is, is apart from a, a, a graph of global oil prices, it's a graph of Russian history over the last 30 years. If you look at what happens here, you look at the collapse after 19, uh, the beginning of the 1980s, what you're looking at, apart from anything else, is the fall of communism. You're looking at a government that runs out of oil revenues, has to reform its system in order to uh, make itself economically competent in other ways, and therefore destroys itself. You then look at the Yeltsin period, not a great period in Russian history, no money, total internal collapse. You look in particular at this deep dip. You look at the moment when Russia went through four prime ministers in a year, when Yeltsin finally faded out, when the country hit absolute bottom. And as you look at the recovery, I like to think not because of him, but in, in his company, you look at the arrival of Vladimir Putin. And you look at a man who however awful the press he may get here and elsewhere in Europe and the United States, is extremely popular with the Russian people because he was there at the time that the price went up again and he was therefore able to dish out lots of goodies to his people and even despite all of the stuff they've had recently, the demonstrations and all of that, who remains a very, very popular president of Russia. So the first point about Russia, 
um, an important concept as you look at politics and energy is the concept of the oil curse, which is governments which have vast amounts of oil or rent rentier economy uh, uh, funds of one sort and another, and therefore don't have to worry very much about popular opinion because they are not dependent on taxes. Russia is a splendid example of the oil curse. We have an authoritarian, on the whole rather incompetent government, which nevertheless remains solidly in place because of this great influx of oil revenues. And the oil curse we will come back to uh, when we get to the Middle East. The other important fact about Russia is that, of course, if you've got all these revenues coming in, you want to keep your people happy, you dish it out in terms of extra social spending of one sort or another, which Russia has exactly done that. Um, and the consequence is that the break-even price for, for, for oil for such a country, the price below which you cannot let the oil fall because you haven't got enough money for all your social spending, in the case of Russia, is now of the order of $100, $120 a barrel. Russia cannot allow the price of oil, if it has enough control over it, to fall below that value. And we'll come back to the issue of the break-even price for oil for other major producers in a minute. But the main point I want to make about Russia is that with all these oil resources, they have been, they have been able to become an immensely troublesome component on the world scene. First time I was there, 1994 to 1998, was the Yeltsin period, the period at the bottom of the graph. They were dependent on the West for support, for finance, for all of that. They therefore kept quiet even when we did things they really hated, like the Kosovo invasion, like the expansion of NATO. When I went back there as ambassador, 2004 to 2008, they had the money, and they were suddenly very self-confident indeed. And we had a whole string of massive problems. And you will no doubt recall the Georgia War. Um, I vividly recall, in effect, the forceful takeover of two major British energy exercises going on in Russia, Sakhalin II, which is a big gas a project on the Sakhalin Island in the east, and TNKBP, which is a very big BP investment there. Um, all sorts of hideous things happened, and because not only do they have all these, uh, these, these assets, but also their exports go very largely to Europe, about 25% of Europe's gas production and 30% of Europe's oil um, consumption come from Russia, other European countries are very cautious about alienating them. So I don't know if the name Litvinenko means anything to you. This was a Russian citizen, actually a British citizen at the time, poisoned in London with polonium in a very unpleasant way. I had the misfortune to be British ambassador in Moscow at the time. This was described as the low point in Anglo-Russian relations since the end of the Cold War. One of the things we did in order to register with the Russians that it really wasn't the way you behaved was we went to our EU partners and said, come on, join up with us and let's put in a complaint. And they didn't. And the reason that they didn't is because their dependence on Russian oil and gas made them very wary about provoking the bear. So having oil, having gas gives you international clout. I want to talk briefly about two other geopolitical factors flowing from Russia's uh, changing situation. One, I'm going to be very quick about this, but it is fascinating, is the Arctic. Um, and this is also related to climate change, of course. Um, even as we speak, the Arctic sea ice is steadily melting. That is a graph of the extent of Arctic sea ice over the last 20 years, and you see it is, it is steadily diminishing. This is opening up the Arctic, first of all for navigation, routes which people died to try and find their way around in the 18th and 19th centuries, the Northwest Passage and the Northeast Passage, are now opening up more and more. Four supertankers, first of all, no supertankers went around uh, the north of Russia three years ago. Two years ago, four went round. Last year, 50 went round. A whole new transport route is opening up up there of immense advantage to the Russians. But what is also opening up is a vast oil and gas province. That's a map of the uh, oil and gas resources uh, in, in, in the Arctic. There's a lot of them. They're scattered around. And sadly, there is some contention about where the borders lie. That's a map of you can see the Russian claim up there in the, in, the, in the north. There are various disputed areas. There are some rules. It's very easy to decide who has what inside um, territorial waters. But there is a, a big argument impending about where territorial waters extend to. And I want to introduce you to a friend of mine at this point. This is Artur Chilingarov. He used to come to my drinks parties in Russia. Real old pirate, Russian Arctic explorer. He is the man who planted a Russian flag under the North Pole, you will remember, five years ago as a symbol of Russia's expectation that when the claims are sorted out, they are going to take a lot of the, a lot of the money. 
Uh, we'll come back to him as well. He's a wonderful guy and a sign of the way the world is changing. But we're in for a really serious argument about what's going on in the Arctic. The, the Arctic Council, which sort of presides over the Arctic, is one of those bijou international organisations which works wonderfully well when nothing very important is going on, but is suddenly facing a very serious demand on its services as people like Chinese, the real, real international hoodlums, try to join. OK, the other um, uh, geopolitical effect, of course, of Russia's growing um, energy strength is indeed their relationship with China. China, needless to say, very fast-growing, huge appetite, fast-growing appetite for energy. There's Russia sitting next door with vast oil and gas fields. They've already done a $25 billion deal. There's going to be a lot more of that and a lot more pipelines. I'm not going to draw any immediate conclusions from that, but a world in which Russia and China move together, as they have in so many other ways, is obviously an even more challenging world for the goodies, like us and the United States and so on, than it might otherwise B. Okay, let's move on then from that rather troubled part of the world to another troubled part of the world, the Middle East. Now, the first thing I want to say to you about the Middle East, having spent quite a lot of my time on Middle East policy, is that not all politics in the Middle East is actually about oil. I was heavily involved in the invasion of Iraq and all of that, which didn't prove an entirely successful venture, but we have been accused since of doing that for oil-related reasons, and that is simply untrue. The challenges posed by Saddam notably in terms of weapons of mass destruction, um, were, as we thought at the time, real and required response. And I'm very happy to discuss this afterwards, since I know it's not entirely uncontentious territory. But having said that not all the politics in the region is about oil and gas, an awful lot is. Um, here are the world's top oil exporters. Russia's actually a bit bigger than that now. But you will see that this is that of them, Saudi, Kuwait, the UAE, and Iran are all Middle Eastern countries. Fundamentally, future global oil and gas policy is about the Middle East. That's estimates of current reserves. The big yellow bit at the bottom is the Middle East. 56% of current estimated recoverable reserves are in the Middle East. This is where energy politics really hits its, uh, its crisis. And the Middle East... Various things you can say about it, but let, let me remind you. First of all, it is a prominent example of the oil curse. It is full of, or was up until last year, full of unreformed, very difficult to reform dictatorships and kingdoms, on the whole, very unwilling to become democracies. At the time, um, well, the world is becoming more democratic, I should say. There were 12 democracies in the world in 1945. There are about 120 now. The Middle East did not follow that trend. Uh, the Arab League states... Uh, very few of them are, 16 out of 20 Arab League states are in fact autocracies at the moment. If you look at the list of the 10 richest countries in the world, two of them are not democratic. I used to use this example with my students. I used to say it's good to be democratic because it makes you rich. Look at the list of the, of the 10 richest countries in the world. I think it's more than 10, probably 15. Only two of them are, democratic, are not democratic. Those are the UAE and Kuwait. They're both Arab states. So the, the resistance in the region to going dem democratic is very, is very strong. That is combined with, and I find this very hard to explain, but the world's most dynamic, forward-pressing religion, which is, of course, Islam, a youth bulge, and a whole concatenation of really quite dangerous political pressures coming together in the region. Um, and that has already let off various explosions. The first was in Iran in 1979, the revolution there, producing a really very difficult to deal with state, a state with nuclear aspirations. You remember the hostage crisis back straight after the thing. If none of you have seen the film Argo, currently or just recently released, I strongly recommend it for giving you the flavour of Tehran straight after the revolution and the US is concerned to get its, its hostages out. Um, and things went very badly wrong, of course, in Tehran. And if I had to predict a big crisis for late this or early next year, it's Iran. Uh, Iran is working very hard to acquire a nuclear weapon. They are bust, but buttressed by very large oil revenues, um, and they, they show no sign of stopping despite external pressure from the United States and other places, and very clear Israeli hints that if nothing else works, then military means will have to be used. You go for Iran, there's a threat to the Straits of Hormuz, through which 80% of the world's oil travels. You are you're really facing a very major crisis, so keep your televisions on. Um, so the, the Iran was the first outbreak. The second outbreak uh, was, 
uh, well, let me show you this picture. It's very hard to find slides which get over the reality of 9-11. I was in America. I was in Washington when it happened. And it is impossible to overstate the, the, the powerful effect that that terrorist attack had upon the United States and the United States' attitude to the world. Now, as I say, the pictures don't capture it. And I thought it best. This is a picture, of course, of the New York waterfront with lights where the World Trade Center used to be. This has been a, a real wrench to our history. And as we looked at it, as we worked on it in Washington at the time that all this had happened, one of the clear conclusions was that the Arab world had gone wrong. There, was the, there were various reports done at the time, a thing called the World Development Report, which contained all sorts of eye-opening statistics, such as that fewer books have been published in the entire Arab world since the invention of printing than are published in Switzerland every year. Uh, this is a place which has gone culturally very badly wrong, pressures of Islam I've already mentioned, and so on. And that translated itself via uh, um, anger at what they saw as Western imperialism into 9-11, into these events. Um, and we began asking ourselves, what can we do about this? The policy of keeping the Middle East quiet up until then had basically been you know, put up with the dictators, keep them in place. They're fundamentally friendly because, on the whole, they're anti-Islamic. The policy changed after 9-11, believe it or not, to much more pressure on people like President Mubarak of Egypt and so on to begin to democratise their governances. It was a varying effect on the whole. It was pretty ineffective. The Arab world, as I've already said, remained a thoroughly undemocratic place until we get to the end of 2011 when suddenly technology catches up with the whole region um, and the Arab Spring takes place. A whole string of autocratic governments fall. In Egypt, in, uh, in, in Tunisia, in Libya, we help it fall. The war is still going on in Syria. All of that. Now, that sounds a long way from the oil-producing end of the, of the Arab world, but it isn't actually that far. The cultural and social links are very close. Um, the, uh, the, the people move between the two things and watch each other. And indeed, it has to some extent affected the, the oil-producing gulf, Kuwait has had immense problems and has had to become substantially more democratic. There is, you probably read about it in the papers this week, a, re a renewal of the insurgency in Bahrain. And Bahrain is in effect a part of Saudi Arabia, just across the, uh, the straits from the, the oil-producing eastern province of, of Saudi Arabia, and with potentially exactly the same problems. It's a Shia Sunni problem in Bahrain, as it could easily be in Saudi Arabia uh, as well. So this conflagration hasn't yet seriously hit oil production, but it's burning at the edges. It's there, it's very close. It could very easily tip over very quickly. Let me show you this man, Mohamed Mursi, who in a sense is at the center of it, the new president of Egypt. Um, you have seen the problems he has had. He's, a, he's an Islamic brother, one of the Ikhwan, trying to impose a more Islamic way of government in Egypt. The country is virtually ungovernable at the moment. If he falls, who knows what will follow. His fate, is a reflection of the fate of an awful lot of the Arab world uh, after him. So there are real threats out there to, 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 to our oil production, gas production in the Middle East. It's under control at the moment, but as I say, it's burning around the edges. And to come back to a point I made about Russia, to deal with this in the Gulf the way they've done it, as the Russians did, is dish out money to their people. Social spending throughout the Gulf has, 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 has gone to immense lengths and these are the break-even prices um, for oil now in the Gulf. And you'll see that Saudi Arabia cannot run its government if the oil price falls below $84 a barrel. Qatar, $65, Kuwait, $88, and so on. Again, you have key oil producers who cannot let the price fall too far because the consequence would be social disruption and potentially revolution in their countries. Another reason why I'm inclined to believe whatever happens with shale, that we're living in a high-priced oil world for the foreseeable future. And there are big, big questions about the whole future of the region. Is it turning Islamist? Um, what's going to happen in the Middle East dispute with Israel? Um, will the, the, the troubles of Egypt and Tunisia and so on infect uh, Saudi Arabia and Qatar and, and the Gulf shapes them? And this is important because there's one external player who has been crucial to maintaining stability, believe it or not, in the Middle East, and guiding the place in roughly the right direction, which is the United States. And the United States, people are beginning to worry, 
actually doesn't have the incentives to, to maintain the same interest, the same grip that it has had in the past. Um, as I've said, shale gas, shale oil increasingly, are moving the United States towards energy self-sufficiency. BP are now predicting that the United States will be energy self-sufficient in the next 30 years. Now, if they're self-sufficient, why do they need to worry anymore about defending the oil uh, passages, defending the world's seaways, keeping, as far as they can, some peace in the major oil-producing areas of the world? There are good answers to that question. They obviously have other interests in the sea passages apart from oil. They have a very real interest in Israel, in the, in, in the region. But at the very least, I think the pressures on the United States to be out there doing things diminish. And the United States currently has a president, Mr. Obama, who, in his inauguration speech and others, has visibly pulled back from US involvement in, um, in the outside world. Um, he's withdrawing from Afghanistan, pivoting to your region of the world, because China is increasingly dominant in, in the way they view the world. And therefore, uh, odds on, and also reducing their armed forces as a whole, so the odds are very much that the United States is going to be less concerned and less interested in maintaining stability in this region than has been the case up until now, and that's a worry. Say what you like about the big, brutal, fascist United States. We depend on them. We, you know, they are the guys who keep the peace. They're the sheriff. No sheriff, and anarchy follows. Finally, let me turn to my, the third chunk of my career, which I promised you. Climate change. Now, when I uh, came here, I assumed good, green New Zealand. I wouldn't need to justify the facts of climate change to an audience such as this. And I found myself at a family barbecue a week ago, talking to my family, who I can assure you are very civilised people, who expressed scepticism. So I thought it important to take you very quickly through the facts, just so that we are quite clear that this is a real problem and a real challenge. That's a graph of greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere over the last 2,000 years. And you can see what happens at the end there. It goes off the scale. That's already happening. I'm not inventing this. That's a real change in the composition of our, of our atmosphere. Um, that and, and the science linking greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere to global temperatures is incontrovertible. Nobody argues about it. If it didn't exist, the, 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 the planet we live on will be uninhabitable. The planetary temperature will be about minus 15. It is actually 6 on average. And the reason for that 21 degree difference is because there are greenhouse gas um, concentrations in the atmosphere. As a result, therefore, of the change in the composition of the atmosphere, global temperatures have also gone up. This takes you back from pre-industrial times up till now. And uh, climate change sceptics, I have to say, have made a great play of this flattening out over the last few years. But the reality is that the world is now already significantly warmer than it was, significantly 0.8 of a degree. That doesn't sound like much, but that contains a lot of extra energy in the atmosphere. It contains the potential for droughts in the Midwest, as we've just seen, for hurricanes in Europe, as we've just seen, and so on. Um, the sea is higher. It's quite striking that in the UK, that we've erected a splendid Thames barrier, which is designed to prevent tidal surges hitting London. When we built it, we expected to raise it about once every two years. We're now raising it six times a year, and that is entirely the consequence of much bigger winds over the North Sea, combined with a higher North Sea. You, see, you have the, the, the consequences in this part of the world, coral bleaching, of course, in the, on the Great Barrier Reef, all sorts of things. I'm going to come back to the, Antarctic, uh, the Arctic, but I've already mentioned it. There, the ice is going. So climate change is real. Again, I'm happy to come back to this afterwards, but that is an unavoidable fact. Um, and therefore, what are we doing about it? What we're doing about it is we've had a great negotiation, which I was an early participant in. It started at uh, the Rio so-called Earth Summit back in 1992, and has been going on ever since. Um, and I, this is a very patent Tony Brenton graph. This is my graph of the progress of the climate change negotiating process because uh, I, I lecture about this to Cambridge students. We start off back here. What is up here is the level of commitment by governments, and what's along here is time, of course. So we start off back here with nobody really believing in it at all. Then a thing called the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, produced a report, a worrying report back then, which pushed us all into negotiating a rather meaningless agreement at Rio, the so-called Climate Change Convention, whereupon everybody cheerfully lost interest and the, all, the attention fell away, until the IPCC produced another, even scarier report um, in 1995, which then shoved us into a really quite demanding negotiation 
which produced what looked like a pretty good agreement at Kyoto um, in whenever that was, 1997, except that the Americans instantly recused themselves and said, we're not going to do what we're committing ourselves to here in terms of global greenhouse gas emissions. So we all lost interest again. The IPCC, we then got caught up, and this is a ridiculous story, in getting Kyoto into force, even without the United States. But the IPCC then produced two more reports of growing levels of scariness about sea level rises, as I say, hurricanes, droughts, the whole works. And that kicked us into another round of negotiation, which produced, in particular, the famous Copenhagen meeting, where um, Obama found himself in a room with the deputy Chinese foreign minister at the end, and, and brings us on to Durban, which is the most recent meeting that we've had. Now, that all looks quite encouraging. You start off very low, and you end up quite high. But this 20 years of negotiation actually has not produced uh, any measurable effect at all on the, on, on the shape of the atmosphere. Over those 20 years, atmosphere concentration, uh, atmospheric emissions of global has, greenhouse gases have in fact gone up by 45%. Why? Developed countries, as I pointed out in an earlier slide, their emissions are roughly speaking flat. The answer, of course, is China again. There are Chinese versus US emissions over the period since 1990. And this means the whole negotiation has changed. What started off as a negotiation between developed countries about getting their emissions down, with the developing countries saying, you put it there, you sort yourselves out. Our business is, is economic development, and we're going to burn as much coal and oil and gas as we need to to achieve that. We are now in a world where that no longer works, where the developing countries have to make a contribution to getting emissions down, because otherwise, with China emitting in the way they are, any agreement is meaningless. And that's one reason why, going back a minute, one reason why this graph does rise optimistically at the end, um, because China and India and so on are finally coming on board and agreeing that they need to take on targets too. But, um, optimistic though that is, 20 years negotiation, no tangible product, um, it's going to take a long, long time to turn this gruesome process into really binding cuts in the atmospheric layers, uh, in, the at in atmospheric concentrations. As I say, this it, the whole um, exercise was very good for my bridge because the developing world used to go off in the thing called the G77 and have vast discussions among themselves. And we were left sitting around doing nothing. So I played bridge with the Americans and all the other people. And I, I think I can even stand up to my mother now. Um, so are we facing real disaster? Possibly. As I say, this negotiation, even if it gets somewhere, is going to get there too late. There's one rather optimistic thing, which I cannot resist mentioning, however, which is a concept which has arisen recently, the concept of geoengineering. The idea that even if the governments of the world can't agree to get their emissions down, you can somehow tinker with the atmosphere in a way that limits the amount of sunlight coming in. And there's some crazy ideas, like mirroring over the Sahara Desert so the sunlight is simply reflected back. Um, but there are also some quite sensible and cost-effective ideas. If you sow the upper atmosphere with sulfur, that reflects back the... Uh, the sunlight, and you could get, I mean, this is something that volcanoes do anyway. After Krakatoa blew up, global temperatures fell by about half a degree for about a decade. So that is a possibility. And one other possibility is feeding the ocean plankton with iron filings, because that makes them grow and they eat carbon dioxide. The problem is that environmentalists hate it, because, of course, you're tinkering with a global, um, a global one of the global commons in a very profound way. Um, and also, it's uncontrollable. An individual government, the United States or China, actually, could afford to sow the upper atmosphere with sulfur without any international agreement at all. So let me introduce me to, your, to the third bearded man in my, in my gallery. Russ George. Story last year. He's an American entrepreneur, scientist, what have you. He went off to the Pacific last year with 100 tonnes of um, iron sulphate in, in, in the, in, in the uh, bowels of his ship and sowed a load of plankton with his iron sulphate. Huge outcry. The Guardian and similar places said, this is awful, he's playing with it. But that sort of individual intervention in the climate is now more and more possible, and more and more likely the longer it takes us to get a proper international agreement on it. So, where do we end up at the end of that rather miscellaneous tour of global energy matters? I hate these sorts of slides, but I thought I should write this down anyway. Um, firstly, energy is going to remain a key driver of world politics. As we all become more energy dependent, as we burn more, whether or not we put carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, as we worry more about where we're getting from it, um, it's going to be there 
front and centre of global politics. As I just said, a graph of global oil prices is in effect a graph of Russian politics over the last 20 years. And that's going to be about fossil fuels. The estimate is that by 2030, they will still account for 82% of global use um, by then. Secondly, the key producing countries are going to remain the same troublesome bunch that they are at the moment. We're going to have to live with a Russia, which is very big in the, in the energy producing field, and in particular a Middle East, which in, 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 if anything is going to loom larger and larger. It's been estimated that 91% of the growth in global oil production up to 2025 is going to be in the Gulf. So we're going to have to carry on worrying about these very worry producing countries. Third, the pattern of consumption is changing. As I showed you on an earlier slide, 70% of the growth is now taking place in non-OECD countries, particularly in India and China. Now this has real political consequences. It means that countries like the US are able to worry less about international sea passages. It means that countries like China are going to worry more and are perhaps going to get more involved in policing uh, the global sea passages and so on. It means, as I've said, there is every prospect of Russia and China drawing even closer together at a time when that is not a very attractive prospect for the Western nations. And, of course, as I've said, the, the achievement by the US of, of energy independence, which gives them the ability to step back if they want to, I suspect they don't want to, but I suspect they will be less interested, so we have a, a partially disengaged sheriff with all of, the, all of the implications that that carries. Fourth point, we're not going to solve climate change in the immediate future, or even in the non-immediate future. For a few decades, we're going to, going to live in a world which is going to get warmer, where the seas are going to get higher, where um, plankton are going to get fatter, where coral is going to continue to die, where we're going to have hurricanes, droughts, all of that. I'm not predicting Armageddon, but I am predicting a world which is going to be significantly different. We have pavement cafes all over London. When did that happen? Um, a world which is going to be significantly different from the world we now live in, and it's a world, since we can't stop it, that we're going to have to adapt to. And finally, having made all of those bland, not bland, but broad assertions about the world energy world, there are very big uncertainties out there. I've mentioned a couple shale gas and geoengineering. Either of them could knock any of all of these predictions sideways if, they are, they, 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 if shale turns out to be as big as it looks as it is in the United States, then that's going to have a, a serious effect. And if people start seriously geoengineering, then thank God we can forget about the UN negotiations and carry on with other things, but there's the danger of lots of side effects. So I would treat all predictions in the energy world, including the ones that I have offered you, with scepticism. And I couldn't resist putting that thought in a rather more colourful way I remind you of Artur Chilingarov, <laughs> Mohamed Mursi, and uh, Grant Russell, avoid men with beards. Thank you very much indeed.